about three years ago, I had a ridiculous idea. And I know it was ridiculous because every time I'd tell it to someone, they'd say, that is ridiculous. But I kept working on this idea, and eventually I decided to write a book about it. And I can remember the first pre-contract review I got of this book. And this is a direct quote. It said, the title, How to Build a Brain, might mislead students and the least critically minded readers into thinking that unified theories of brain function are possible. That's right, my idea was now not only ridiculous, but impossible. But I kept thinking about it, and I thought, you know, this, this is going to be hard, and it's going to take a long time. But isn't this really what most neuroscientists, computer scientists, and psychologists want to do? Deep down, we might write papers that have titles like Single Neuron Tuning in Larval Zebrafish Escape Behavior. <laughs> but don't we want to understand how the brain works? The whole brain? Our whole brain? Which is perhaps our most intimate home. We know that every time we learn something new, play a fast-paced game of hockey, or utter a sentence like this one, these are the results of the electrochemical maelstrom going on in between our ears. Now, I want to be clear on the challenge involved. We want to understand how this basic component gives rise to thoughts. Neurons like this one gather input from hundreds or thousands of other neurons, and if that input is high enough over a long enough period of time, it emits a single electrical spike, resets itself, and waits for more input. That spike then travels to hundreds or thousands of other neurons, and this kind of cascade continues. And this is the process you're seeing here. And this is just like the process going on inside every head in this audience. Think about that. Now, in fact, my research is not focused on how a single neuron works. What drives me is trying to understand how hundreds, thousands, or even millions of neurons cooperate to give rise to any of the many behaviors that we can perform. Right now, you're seeing a model which has two and a half million neurons in it. And by model, I mean a mathematical description that we simulate in order to see what happens. So we write software that describes how each of the neurons work and how they communicate, and then we run that program on a supercomputer. And in fact, it takes two and a half hours to simulate one second of the video that you're watching here. So computers aren't that great at simulating the brain. And actually, I'll come back to this later. But for now, let me just talk about this particular model. In my lab at the University of Waterloo, we referred to this model with an acronym, S-P-A-U-N, or SPAWN for short. SPAWN is currently the world's largest functional brain model. And it's this word functional that makes it such an exciting project for me. In short, it means that SPAWN gives rise to recognizable cognitive behaviors. Now, in fact, other groups have built models that are as big as SPAWN, or in fact, sometimes bigger. But those models don't behave. They don't see or remember or act. In contrast, Spawn can see. It's seeing the digits that it's being shown. Spawn can remember. It can remember those digits for use in the future. And Spawn can act. It's attempting to move its arm to reproduce the visual style of the digits that it's being shown. And notice that we can look at the pattern of spikes generated at any point in the model, and we can interpret those patterns. So this gives us a clear understanding of the relationship between those basic components and higher level functions. Now, in fact, it's challenging to build models of any one of these functions. It's more challenging to build a model with many functions that we coordinate to solve some particular task, like you just saw. But it gets really exciting when we think about how to flexibly coordinate brain functions. But what do I mean by flexibly coordinate? Well, as many of you probably know, different parts of the brain are associated with different sorts of functions. So there are parts for seeing, for hearing, smelling, remembering, and so on. But in fact, when it comes time to solve a particular task, the brain itself must flexibly determine which of those functions are needed, and then it has to coordinate those functions or in order to solve that task. This kind of flexible coordination is something that comes so naturally to people, we don't even think about it. You can go from playing a game of chess, to answering some questions, to fetching a cup of coffee in a matter of minutes and with no effort. Machines are really good at playing chess. They're really good at answering Jeopardy questions. Machines aren't that great at fetching coffee. But more importantly, 
no machine is good at all of these things. So there's currently this gap between specialist artificial intelligence and general natural intelligence. But I think that models like Spawn are actually beginning to close this gap. Here is a problem of a kind you'd find on a standard IQ test. Think about how you figure out what goes in that space at the end when you look at the pattern of numbers. Well, we can, in fact, watch Spawn perform exactly this task. So Spawn is looking at these digits in order to figure out what goes in the space at the end, even though it's never seen this problem before. And this is exactly the same model that we saw moving its hand to draw digits. So this takes the coordination of visual processing, memory, language-like reasoning, and action. And in fact, if we show Spawn many, model, or many uh, problems of this kind over and over, we find that, because it's never seen them before, sometimes it makes mistakes. And overall, it makes about the same number of mistakes as a human of average intelligence. But what kinds of mistakes does it make? Well, think about another task for a minute. Think about remembering a list of digits, maybe the combination for a lock. If you're going to forget any of those digits later on, it's most likely to be the ones in the middle. And we were surprised to find that the same kind of thing happens in Spawn. So here we can watch as it's remembering a list of digits. And watch the representation of the 8 as it fades over time. This is because that information is no longer encoded in that pattern of activity. So when Spawn comes to write out that number, it draws a horizontal line indicating it doesn't know what's there, and then it continues the task. And if we run Spawn on many versions, of lists like this of many different lengths, we find a pattern in the errors, and it's a human-like pattern. Like you, Spawn remembers the beginning and the ends of lists better than the middle. Now, I want to step back and just think about an idea that's lurking in the background here. Spawn is not an abstract model that lets us think about how to coordinate information flow to solve a task. It's a brain-like model. There are, in fact, five other tasks that this exact model can do. So it can do simple mental addition, and it takes about as long as people to do that. It can gamble, I mean, it makes the same kinds of choices that people make. It can recognize handwritten digits it's never seen before, with about the same accuracy as people, and so on. In short, Spawn makes human-like mistakes, it has human-like accuracy, and it takes human-like lengths of time to process information. And I think that this is because it's solving this problem of flexible coordination in the same way that the brain does. If this is true, and this is still a big if, but if this is true, I think it suggests two ways that we can use models like Spawn. One is to better understand how the brain actually works. So for example, we can look at the behavioral consequences of brain damage without damaging a real brain. And I honestly believe that understanding this connection between basic biological mechanisms and high-level behavior will revolutionize the way we treat brain disorders. A second way that we can use these kinds of models is to build computers and robots that are much more natural for us to interact with. Now, currently, this is just a dream because the brain is so powerful. As I mentioned, it takes two and a half hours to simulate one second of Spawn's behavior. So we need to build new kinds of computers. And this is why we are working with other groups to build specialized hardware, which is sometimes called neuromorphic hardware, that will simulate billions of neurons in real time using thousands of times less energy than the computers of today. And one thing that we want to do with this neuromorphic hardware is to connect models like Spawn to the world, to give these brains a body. While you are witnessing the first public demonstration of a robot being fully controlled by this brain-like architecture, it is extremely simple. It's just running on my laptop. But nevertheless, it's moving its arm, moving itself, and deciding where to go using only spiking neurons, just like Spawn does. And more interestingly, just like you do. And finally, it's important to me that all of the tools we've written to build these kinds of demonstrations, simulations, models, and videos are in the public domain. Everything that we make is completely open source. And hopefully, this will inspire a community of brain builders, because I am convinced that building a brain cannot be left to a single lab. There's plenty of complexity for everyone.
But you know, in spite of this complexity, with these kinds of tools, with these sorts of developments in hardware, and with our deepening understanding of how the brain works, I'm beginning to think that maybe my idea wasn't so ridiculous after all. Thank you.